In this tutorial, we're going to take a look at applications involving exponential functions and just uh, several examples that uh, uh, you can model data using an exponential function as exponential growth. And so in the first one, we've got this uh, fictional town of Goldbrush, and they experience a population boom, uh, since gold is discovered, of course. Uh, we're told that the uh, population starting in 1990 was 1,200 people, but because of the uh, discovery of the gold, it's growing pretty fast at a rate of 13%. So uh, it says complete the table. So in 1990, here's the uh, 1,200 uh, people, and uh, and it says determine when the population will double. So we're going to read that from the table, but then take a look at a couple of alternate methods to uh, look at that in, in the subsequent page, the next page. So if I want to increase something by 13%, now and actually I'll write this up first here to increase something by 13%, multiply by 1.13, and I want to explain why that's the case how that works. So let's say I had my $1,200 here, $1,200, 1,200 people, sorry, and I'm going to add to that 13% of 1,200. 13% we'd multiply by 0 0.13. So this is the initial amount and this is the increase and that will give us what the population is going to be increased by 13%. Now, um, 1200 is actually a common factor of both these parts and this is just numerical common factoring there's no algebra here so I'm going to factor a 1200 of this and so remember when you're factoring you're actually dividing so if I want to factor a 1200 out of a 1200 I divide this by 1200 and so 1200 divided by 1200 is 1 and then we have this plus and if we divide a 1200 out of this well, those divide out, so we get just 0 0.13 after the plus sign. So basically, this is 1,200 multiplied by 1 1.13. See, this 1 is the original amount, and then we're adding 13% to it. So that's why I'm multiplying by 1, 3. 1.13. So let's say instead I want to let's say I want to increase something by let's say 32%. Let's say for example. Well, I would multiply by 1.32 because that one gives the original amount, and this is adding 32% of it. Um, in the province of Ontario, we uh, we have an HSD a tax of 13%. So, see, this is actually what you would multiply something by to just automatically add the tax on by increasing it by 13%. So, let's get rid of that. There we go. So, if I take my calculator here and go 1,200 people times 1.13, so that's going to be 1,356. Let's bring the calculator back. So 1356 times 1.13. So the 1991 population was this, increases by 13%. So in 1992, we'll have 1,532 people. I'm going to round it to the nearest whole number. We can't have 0.28 of a person. So I'll put this as 1532. Uh, this is 1731 because if we take the 1532 and multiply it by 1.13, we get 1731 to the nearest whole number. And then I'm not going to do every, every one individually. This is what the rest of them look like. We just keep on rounding to the nearest whole number and multiplying by 1.13. So um, in, in B it says determine when the population will double. Well, it started at 1200. So double that would be 2400. So it takes uh, about six years. This is just past double. We're not going to worry about getting to the nearest month or day of a month or anything like that. So it takes about or just under six years. So in 1996, that's when it's going to be doubled. Moving on to the next page. So another strategy would be to graph this data and look where the population doubles to 2,400. So this is all my plot point points plotted. Uh, the scale here is 200. So 200, 4, 6, 8, that'd be 1,000, 12, 14, 16, 18, that'd be 2,000, 2,200, 2,400. So let's go across from here. Hits the graph about there. And so it's about six years. So six years after 1990 again would be the 1996. Now another way we can do this 
would be to uh, to create an, an equation to use to find this. And so um, we're going to write an equation uh, in terms of the initial population and the time, time being in years, uh, to again find when the population doubles to 2400. So this is my formula. P stands for population. So population is written as a function of time. So I'm using function notation here. Starts at 1200 and we're multiplying by 1.13 uh, a certain number of times. The power of that is actually is the uh, uh, number uh, of years. Now to show you a little more about why the formula works like that, let's bring the calculator back here. And actually let's go back to the uh, previous page. So we took the 1200 and we multiply it by 1.13 to get the 1356. And then we took that and multiplied by another 1.13 to get this. So basically, if I take that 1200 and multiply it by 1.13 twice, 1.13, then you see I should get this number. And so that's the 1532. If I were, so that's actually 1200 times 1.13 to the power of 2. See, the power is just the number of years. So, for example, the 1956, that was one, two, three, four years down the road. So, if I were to take the 1200 and multiply it by 1.13 to the power of 4, I should get 1956. Now, <coughs> excuse me, a little bit of rounding. Okay, so that's this would actually round to 1957, okay, because there's no rounding in that calculation whatsoever. We've rounded a few times here, that's why it's difference, differing by one person. But essentially, that's that, that's the way it works. So let's go back to the next page. Okay, so uh, if I wanted to, let's say I didn't know that in taking about six years, so I could plug a number like four in, like the calculation I just did. And uh, so that's the 1950s, well, 56, 57. Uh, not high enough, okay, we want to get to 2400. So, you know, we could uh, try another one again. I could go uh, 1200 times 1.13 to the power of, oh, maybe it's one more year, five years. Oh, not quite at 2,400 yet. Okay, so we could, uh, you know, try six years. Oh, here, 2,498. Uh, again, differing by one from the table because of the rounding or not rounding. So there, it takes about six years. So we could just uh, do some trial and error with the calculator to get those amounts. That's what you're going to see here. The population after five years was uh, about 2,211. After six years, it was the 2498. So again, uh, it's taking about 12 years, uh, sorry, six years to double to 2400. So just through a little bit of trial and error. So another example on the third page here. Uh, we've got this 300 gram sample of uh, radioactive boron-7. Uh, it has a half-life of six minutes. A half-life means the amount of time it takes for half of it to dissipate to break down into another substance is no longer boron-7. This means that for every six minutes, uh, the amount remaining is half of the original amount. So the mass of boron-7 in grams remains after t minutes can be modeled by. So we start with 300, so that's the initial amount, just like the 1200 was the initial population in the, in the gold, the gold, gold rush town. And in this case, it's half-life, so we're multiplying it by half um, because it's becoming a half every six minutes to the power of, and it would be the number of hours, sorry, number of minutes, maybe, did I say hours up here? It's every six minutes. Uh, the number of uh, minutes divided by six. Uh, and the reason it's divided by six because that's going to give you the number of half-lifes. So, for example, if it was six minutes, six divided by six is one half-life. If it was 12 minutes, if we put 12 in here, 12 divided by six is two, so the half, two, that would be two half-lifes. So we use this formula to figure out how many there are after a certain amount of time. So when A it says determine the mass that remains after one hour. Now remember time is in minutes here. So this would be 60 minutes. So we're going to be putting 60 in the formula in place of time. So uh, 60 divided by 6 is 10. So it's 300 times a half to the power of 10. So this is 10 half-lifes. And you see if you're actually doing the calculation sort of long form, see we would start with a 300 times a half, 0.5. That's how much is left after one half-life. 
times 0.5 again. See, it's down to 75 now, times 0.5 again. That's another half-life. So it starts getting fairly small very quickly. So if we evaluate, I guess I should have done that one here, actually. So 300 times 0.5 to the power of 10. Uh, we're down to, well, only about a quarter of a gram, 0.29 grams. So it's, it gets pretty small because there's so many half-lives. So the amount of boron left after 60 minutes or an hour is down to 0.29 grams. So after an hour, there's about 0.29 grams of the boron-7 remaining. Not very much. So in, uh, in, in B here, it says, or you're asked to find, how long does it take for this 300 gram sample to decay to 100 grams? So of course it's going to be less than the hour, because after an hour we're way down to the 0.29. So we could just try experimenting, well, something less than an hour. So let's say we try 20 minutes. So 20 minutes, the uh, calculation would look like this. We would go 300 times 0.5 to the power of, and then bracket, so 20 over 6. Okay, So that's 29.76, well, about 7. And I'll put all these up here. There we go. So 20, about 29.8, it would round to. So now we're tra talking about how long it takes the gallon to get 100 grams. So that's still quite a bit less than 100. So we need a time smaller than 20. So, and you'll see all these calculations come up here. So let's, um, I'm just going to bring this back up. So instead of 20 minutes, we could try 10. Just change, edit that. So after 10 minutes, it's at 94.5. So we're getting closer because we want to find the time. So it's something a little less than 10 minutes. So I could change the 10 to a 9. And again, just trial and error here. So oh, we're getting pretty close. 106.1. Okay, so you know we're still a little bit. Uh, uh, we're a little bit on on the upper side, we're not quite down to 100 grams. So I could change, let's say nine and a half. So again, just trying some different times in here. Nine and a half minutes, well that's pretty close. So it's pretty close to 9.5 minutes uh, that we're down to about 100 grams. So these are the calculations uh, that I just did. So it takes about nine and a half minutes to get the original sample to decay to uh, 100 grams. So again, just some educated trial and error. One last example in number three here. Uh, a new SUV costs $65,000. and We're told that it loses 20% of its value each year after it's purchased. Once the SUV worth after 40 months. Well, Relating back to the very first example, if something, and actually I think I'll put this up first here. If the SUV loses 20% of its value, so if it's losing 20% of its value, it keeps or retains 80%. So if you take the 100% and subtract 20%, so you really want to know more um, what it's in terms for the formula what it's keeping instead of what it's losing. Because the formula written in terms of what it still has, not what it's actually losing. So it's keeping 80% of its value. So a formula we could use for this is the amount after t years is 65,000 and see we'd be multiplying by 0.8 to get the value at the end of each year. It's gone down 20%, still got 80% to the power of time. So 40 months so 40 divided by, there's 12 months in a year. So that's about, well, three and a third years. So I'll put 3.33 in, in place of uh, time in my formula. And so that's the, uh, that's the calculation. So the initial value, oh, 1,000, times 0.8 to the power of 3.33. And so that's the uh, the amount. So it's worth about thirty thousand nine hundred. I'm going to round to the nearest dollar. I'm not going to worry about cents. Thirty thousand nine hundred seventeen dollars is what it'd be worth after about forty months. So that's some typical questions you can solve using 
exponential functions, uh, their growing problems or decay problems. And that's the end of the tutorial.